Hi there, my name is Grace North and this is my speech. It's called Con uh, Expose, Confront, and Sabotage, Supporting Truth Tellers by Any Means Necessary. Uh, before we get started, I pretty much should introduce myself. My name is Grace North. I work closely with the Courage Foundation, not only as head of Jeremy Hammond's defense committee, but also with other Courage beneficiaries, Lowry Love and Matt DeHart. I am an anarchist and a prison ab abolitionist. I'm a terrible pub public speaker, and I love rainbows and penguins. I started working with Jeremy Hammond in the summer of 2013. That's when I took over as head of his defense committee. Jeremy Hammond, if you don't know, was a hacktivist. He worked with LulzSec and Antisec in 2011 and attacked numerous government, uh, private intelligence agencies, law firms, um, to expose human rights abuses. Um, unbeknownst to him, one of the other members of the group, Hector Monsegur, also known as Sabu, had been arrested several months prior and decided to become an informant for the FBI. So unbeknownst to Jeremy and Jeremy's co-defendants, all of their actions were being recorded by the FBI. Um, he was arrested in March 2012 and eventually sentenced to 10 years in federal prison for his actions. He's currently serving that sentence at Manchester FCI in Manchester, Kentucky. So before we figure out how we can support truth tellers, we need to figure out what is a truth teller. Uh, the Courage Foundation defines truth teller or whistleblower as those who risk life or liberty to make significant contribution to the public record. Uh, this can include anyone involved in the process of whistleblowing from sources through journalists, editors, pub publishers, the couriers and technologists on whom all others rely, and the human rights defenders who make the info visible and try to generate action based on it. So the approach that's generally used to determine whether or not someone is a truth teller is two-pronged. Uh, one, have you brought uh, important information to the public attention? And two, are you facing retaliation for doing so? So now that we know what a truth teller is, uh, who should we consider a truth teller? Well, first, there are truth tellers that come from inside an organization. We all know this man, Edward Snowden. Snowden, of course, stole and leaked numerous classified documents that uncovered massive surveillance on the part of the NSA. And of course, as you know, Edward Snowden has been effectively exiled to Russia for fear of the reprisal he faces should he ever return to the United States. Snowden is currently facing charges under the Espionage Act, an act Obama has used to prosecute more whistleblowers than any other pres than all other presidents combined. Um, and Snowden's fears are actually very well founded. So this is Chelsea Manning. Chelsea, of course, during her time as a private in the U.S. Army, leaked three quarters of a million classified or unclassified but or unclassified but sensitive military and diplomatic documents the most famous of which are undeniably the, the Iraqi and the Afghan war logs, including the collateral murder video, and a cache of diplomatic cables and the Guantanamo Bay files. Chelsea was court-martialed after speaking with snitch Adrian Lamo, who went to authorities. She was convicted of violating the Espionage Act and sentenced to 35 years in prison, where she has been placed in solitary confinement numerous times and within the past few months has twice attempted to take her own life. Less known but still as important is ex-CIA officer Jeffrey Sterling. He took on the CIA in, mul in multiple ways. He first blew the whistle on racial discrimination uh, in hiring practices within the Bureau, and then leaked information on something called Operation Merlin to author James Risen. Merlin was an op that involved the CIA passing faulty nuclear blueprints to the government of Iran. Many called the program reckless due to the fact that some parts of the blueprint were legitimate. That is, they built an actual working parts for a nuclear reactor. Sterling claimed that the Iranians learned the blueprints were, fault, were flawed, and the Iranians might have gained nuclear insights from the accurate parts. Sterling was also convicted of espionage char charges and is currently serving three and a half years in prison. This, of course, is, Jeff, is Jeremy Hammond. I've already gone over a little bit about him and his case, and many of you probably know about the excessive amounts of time he has spent in the segregating housing, housing unit, or SHU, 
some of it by his own doing, but some of it for such actions as exercising what should be his constitutionally protected right to free speech. But you might not know who this is. This is Ramsey Orta. Ramsey sadly became a well-known pub public figure after filming this. This is a cell phone video shot by Mr. O Orta on July 17th, 2014 in Staten Island, New York. It shows the fatal encounter between several NYPD officers and a man named Eric Garner. The officers originally approached Mr. Garner on the suspicion he was selling loose cig cigarettes. Mr. Garner denied he was selling the cigarettes and became agitated, saying how tired he was of the police harassing him. The police then moved to arrest him, and one of the officers involved placed Mr. Garner in a chokehold, a move that had been banned by the NYPD since 1993. After uttering what became his last words, I can't breathe, said 11 times while face down on the sidewalk, Mr. Garner lost consciousness and eventually died. The officer who administered the chokehold, Daniel Pantaleo, had previously been the subject of two civil rights lawsuits in 2013, where plaintiffs accused him of falsely arresting and abusing them. In one of the cases, he and other officers allegedly ordered two black men to strip naked on the street for a search. The charges against the men were eventually dismissed. After filming this encounter, Mr. Orta claimed the police began harassing him, even going so far as to arrest him on weapons charges for possessing a handgun. Orta testified that the charges were in retaliation for his role in documenting Garner's death, but a grand jury rejected this, charging him with a single felony count of third degree criminal weapons possession and criminal firearm possession. In Garner's case, on the other hand, even though a medical examiner ruled the death a homicide, even though Mr. Garner was unarmed and clearly not a threat to police, and even though Daniel Pantaleo used a move that had been banned by the NYPD for over a decade, jurors determined there was not probable cause that Pantaleo had committed any crime. While in prison awaiting trial, Mr. Orta said he feared the guards would try to poison him, a fear that became all too real when his meatloaf was later found to have been tainted with rat poison. So why should we care about truth tellers? Uh, the first and probably most obvious answer is they tell us important things. To borrow a little from WikiLeaks, uh, in Jeremy's case, the Stratford leak told us about the presence of, again, massive networks designed to spy on Americans and attempt to control foreign governments. It informed us that there is a sealed indictment in the US against Julian Assange. It showed us the existence of a system called Trapwire, which uses, network, which uses a network of surveillance cameras to monitor citizens and to try to predict terrorist behavior. This, along with the fact that Stratford emails also revealed massive, massive corporate spying on activists, obviously has a chilling effect on free speech and raises massive pri privacy concerns. So obviously the persecution of truth tellers has an effect on First Amendment free speech rights of both current and potential truth tellers and the people on whom the corporations and government are harming. The people have a right to know not only what their government is doing, but they have a right to know that they are being harmed, whether that harm is from state agents or from corporate agents. And as we've seen with Jeremy, with Chelsea, with Snowden, and with many other truth tellers, when the curtain is pulled back to reveal the ugly inner workings of both governments and corporations, they will spare no expense or energy in persecuting and, sil and silencing those who embarrass them because ultimately that is what whistleblowing does. It rightfully embarrasses those who thought that they were invincible. It knocks them down a notch. It's standing up to the schoolyard bully. So in essence, the very simple answer to the question of why should we support truth tellers is they laid it all on the line to make the world a better place. And without our support, the systems of power will grind them to death to make an example of them and to ensure that they are the last of their kind. And we have a duty to not let that happen. Because while getting info out there is a general good and the public needs and deserves to know about human rights abuses and malpractices, the reason we really give a shit about truth tellers is that information dis disclosure is one of the best catalysts for social and political action that we know of. So going back to the example of Ramsey Orda, it was his video among sadly dozens of others 
showing the death of an unarmed black man at the hands of police that fuels the Black Lives Matter mo movement. Innocent black be people being killed at the hands of police is sadly nothing new. But it's really been these videos that have been able to counter that narrative of, well, it's justified because... And these videos have shown that these shootings are in no way justified. So now that we have an idea of why we should support truth tellers, the really important question becomes, how do we support truth tellers? And the first thing that we need to remember when supporting truth tellers is this, is that what is legal is not always moral, and what is moral is not always legal. We need to get over this bullshit, well, what they did was illegal, so I'm not gonna support them. Most truth telling is going to involve some illegal acts, but we need to remember that legality and morality are a lot of times at the opposite ends of the spectrum. And this is where the by any means necessary comes into play. Sometimes exposing injustice means doing illegal things, and that's okay. And injustice was never righted by everyone following rules. So once we remember that, our next impetus becomes, what are some of the more concrete and physical ways that we can support truth tellers? So obviously the first and foremost is we must, 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 must protect our sources. Source protection should always be number one when discussing how we can support truth tellers. Two years ago, I was privileged to sit on a stage at 31C3 with Sarah Harrison and completely bomb my, my part of a talk, which was entitled Doing Right by Sources Done, Done Right. In it, Sarah spoke about some steps to take in order to try to ensure that your sources are not, are not discovered. In that talk, Sarah highlighted five specific areas that occur in your contact with a potential truth teller and how you can strengthen each point to ensure your source is protected. They were the initial contact period, handover of documents, the publishing of documents, continuing con contact, and aftercare. Uh, I could sit here for another hour detailing all the amazing points that Sarah made, but since thankfully for all of you, I was only given one speech, I will just leave you with these few brief suggestions and really urge all of you to go check that speech out. But basically her advice is when it comes to protecting sor sources, Best practice pretty much always comes back to four things. Be honest, encrypt everything, don't abandon your sources, and shut the fuck up. Uh, so in the initial contact period, never try and force the source to be put on record information that they wanted to keep off the record. Uh, be very upfront with what protections or assistance will or won't be given. For example, will the journalist be willing to stand in court, face a contempt of court charge, and say, I will, not, I will not tell my source. How far is that journalist willing to go in order to protect the source? Uh, the second part is the handover of the documents. And this is actually the part that usually causes the least amount of issues. When there's trouble, it usually comes in the process either before or after the handoff. Uh, the publishing of documents. Obviously, don't publish any identifying in info about the source and clear anything that could lead to or identify your source. Uh, never confirm or deny a person or people might be your source. Take the impetus off the source. Say WikiLeaks obtained versus a source leaked. Uh, the words leaked versus disclosed. And when all else fails, when it comes to publishing and sourcing, just shut the fuck up. Uh, continuing contact is obviously important for potentially obtaining more documents and aftercare, obviously don't abandon your source. Uh, we also need to understand that protecting sources is not just limited to the person who obtained the material, but the person who verify it, curate it, and publish it. Um, but let's say your truth teller is found out and arrested for their actions. Before you do anything, you need to understand a few things about prison and about prison support. The very first thing that you need to know is how brutally dehumanizing prison actually is. Prison attempts to strip you of everything you are, everything you believe, everything you desire. Understanding this 
We then need to curate a plan that, we're, that will counter this brutal dehumanization and provide the maximum amount of support. Support can take a lot of different forms. The first and foremost thing I always encourage people to do is to write, 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 write. Mail is, and I really cannot stress this enough, vital to prisoners. It lets them know they are not forgotten, it makes them feel loved and supported, and it helps them keep connections with the outside world. Letters don't have to be long or fancy, just heartfelt. Many prisoners, especially in the US, have restrictions on what they can receive in the mail. If you have questions on how to write, contact their support committee or groups that work to advocate for prisoners. Of course, another area that is always needed is money. Pre-trial and sometimes post-trial, money is used to cover court and lawyer costs. In Jeremy's case, we are still using the money people are donating to help make sure he can receive regular lawyer visits so the prison knows we have eyes on them. And should something happen to, Jer to Jeremy, we are ready and willing to fight for his rights. This has been crucial in cases where Jeremy has been sent to shoe. Because we have funds readily available, we have been almost immediately able to mobilize lawyers to visit him to make sure his rights are not being vi violated. We also use it to make sure Jeremy has all the material things that he needs while in prison, as prisoners often work for mere cents on the hour and everything in commissary is marked up substantially from street prices. You can also spread the word. This may seem trivial, but it's one of the most crucially important things that you can do. Tell, tell your friends, tell your coworkers, tell your neighbors, tell your dog walker, tell the dude you sit next to on the bus. Educate yourself about the case and the issues surrounding the case. The persecution of truth tellers affects us all. And finally, we need to support the communities that the truth tellers risked it all to protect. This is probably one of the most overlooked parts of defending and protecting truth tellers, and it's actually one of the most vitally important. Truth tellers have risked their very lives bringing us information and being that catalyst for social change. It is now up to us to take that momentum and keep it going. In Chelsea Manning's case, this means doing everything in our power to put an end to the illegal occupation of Iraq and Afghanistan and loudly and vociferously calling for the closing of Guantanamo Bay. In Jeremy's case, it means, among other things, supporting the survivors of the Union Carbide disaster in Bhopal, India. Emails in the GI files revealed how Dow Chemical had hired Stratfor to spy on activists who are trying to hold Dow Chemical accountable for the 1984 gas leak, considered the world's worst industrial disaster that either killed or sickened almost 600,000 people. In Ramsey Orta's case, it means supporting the Black Lives Matter movement and the push to hold police accountable for their racist actions. And yes, in some cases, these are very American pro problems. Police in Europe don't kill nearly as many people as they do in America. America is the main player in the illegal occupation of Iraq and Afghanistan. America has fucked up a lot of things. Hell. We just elected an actual fucking fascist disguised as a flaccid orange Cheeto. But just because a problem seems to be confined to a certain country does not mean that we the world over can safely ignore it. Members of the tech and hacktivist community are uniquely positioned to support truth tellers. Truth tellers, as I have said before, are one of the best catalysts for social change that we know. And one of the easiest most widely used tool to spread social change is the internet. In his famous letter from a Birmingham jail, Martin Luther King wrote, I cannot sit idly by in Atlanta and not be concerned about what happens in Birmingham. Injustice everywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects us all indirectly. It is this inescapable network of mutuality that compels us as hacktivists, as members of the tech community, and as human beings to act. We've already seen how the tech community can support the marginalized and the oppressed, 
Think back to the Arab Spring where techies posted virtual care packages that included everything from how to skirt government internet censorship by using Tor to how to use manual dial-up should all other forms of internet be, be cut. And it worked. And whether we realized it or not, all of the people who bravely reported on the brutal governmental suppression during that time, they were truth tellers too. Over these past couple years of doing prison support, I've learned that the tech community is pretty good at supporting its own, usually. We have support commu communities for Jeremy Hammond. We have parades and protests and petitions for Chelsea Manning. We have endless petitions for Edward Snowden. But blowing the whistle on injustice is not something that only white people do. And the people that are most affected by it are not going to be the ones we hear about in the news. If we are truly to call ourselves hacktivists committed to generating new possible routes of social and political action within the frameworks of hacktivism, digital culture and information technology, we must expand the definition of who we consider a truth teller and as a result, who we consider worthy of our support. Our support cannot be confined to the overwhelmingly white male world of the tech community. Our support must be universal and without boundaries, or frankly, it's bullshit. Yes, Jeremy Hammond is a truth teller. Chelsea Manning is a truth teller. Edward Snowden is a truth teller. But so is Ramsey Orta. So is Diamond Reynolds, a black woman who bravely streamed her boyfriend's murder at the hands of police on Facebook Live, even as the gun was still pointed at herself and her four-year-old da daughter. So is Zainab Al-Khawaja, a Bahraini pro-democracy activist who has, in the face of multiple arrests, reported on the appalling human rights abuses perpetrated by the government in her home country. So are the hundreds of indigenous water protectors who, as right as we speak, are not only standing up for their lands and homes and their people against the Dakota Access Pipeline, but facing down dogs mace cannons and bullets to expose the raw brutality of both capitalism and the police state. And they, every single one of them, deserve just as much support as we afford to Chelsea, Snowden, or Jeremy. There's also Jeremy's fellow courage beneficiary, Lowry Love, who is currently facing extradition to the U.S. for his alleged role in Op Last Resort, an op that was undertaken in response to the suicide of internet activist Aaron Swartz. Aaron was facing 35 years in prison for simply downloading and distributing academic papers. Aaron sadly chose to take his own life rather than subject himself to brutal US persecution. Those who chose to participate in Op Last Resort, whether they realized it or not, were whistleblowers. They undertook their actions to expose not only the unfairness and brokenness of the US legal system and the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, but also in the hopes of making sure that no other people were faced with the impossible choice of being tortured in a US prison or taking their own life. Unfortunately, this is the exact choice that Lowry is facing today, torture or suicide. 